All right. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Daniel Tiapkin today, who is no stranger to you if you've been around last week. But nevertheless, um, he is a first year PhD student at Ecole Polytechnique in Paris, uh, working with Eric Moulin. And he's interested in topics like exploration and randomization. So today's title is very interesting to me. He is using learning rate randomization for posterior sampling. And yeah, Daniel, welcome and please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much for introduction. Uh, for today's talk, I will talk about, uh, about uh, something that's uh, pretty random by, by structure itself. And, uh, and it will look, uh, from the very beginning, it will look uh, a little bit strange. So you, you may ask uh, why it should work. But in the end, I, I hope that the mystery behind it will be will disappear. So let me just uh, make a very, very quick introduction of to what I will talk about. I will talk about exactly exploration problem in array. So in reinforced, in reinforced learning, as uh, almost uh, everyone I, uh, I'm sure knows, uh, we have a very important challenge between exploration, that visiting uh, uh, novel states, collecting novel data, and exploitation, that using uh, uh, using this data and uh, and exploit this information from this data by the maximal degree. And uh, this challenge is uh, very important for uh, a lot of problems, starting from very simple, just find uh, some good uh, rewards in the in the some unknown corner of very large space. And finalizing something like uh, this uh, uh, Montezuma game, Montezuma Revenge, then we need to do some non-trivial combination of the actions, and it's hard to understand what to do if we will not try a lot of things. Memorize them. So, uh, turning to particular uh, speech, uh, the the main uh, I would say. Is, uh, the main focus will be uh, how to perform bonus-free exploration in a model-free uh, in model-free environments in in model-free for model-free algorithms in tabular environments. So, and uh, for for this purpose, uh, we int uh, introduce randomized cloning algorithm uh, that uses uh, uh, just cloning but with additional randomization in its step sizes. It's uh, somehow related to optimistic posterior sampling things uh, and achieves uh, the same regret bound as cloning with curving bonuses. It's possible to improve it to uh, uh, to bench bonuses, I believe so. But uh, for just for simplicity of everything, we considered only and kind of this a little bit a little bit root bound of h to the power five sat underscore root. And also, very funny thing in, in all the scenarios that it can be very easily generalized to to, uh, to more general setting of the metric spaces with adaptive discretization of the of the space. It can can this randomization technique can be very easily plugged in into existing algorithm for metric spaces, and in the end achieve the same regret guarantees as uh, this cloning based algorithm for metric spaces. So I will start from uh, recalling the definitions. So we will consider in the stock uh, finite horizon uh, MDPs with not necessarily finite set and action pairs. For the first half of the talk, it will be finite, but afterwards we will move to a little bit more general setting. And the process of learning is the following. We have capital T episodes. Uh, each episode lasts for this capital H horizon. Uh, in the st episode T at step H, we stay in some st state STH, take some action. Afterwards, next state generate uh, through, uh, through, state, uh, uh, through inhomogeneous Markov kernels. It depends on the state and taking action. And also we get rewards uh, reward that for simplicity we assume to be known and bounded from zero to one. Uh, yeah, so it's going to be considered uh, to be st also stochastic, but it will kind of it will be not so important for for the main technique. And uh, yeah, and 
our goal is to maximize expected rewards and this goal can be formalized for Bowman equations. So it's uh, very well known equations to, I believe, all of us. So we just uh, yeah, compute expected rewards uh, of all expected rewards in the future. Uh, and it could be done due to Markov structure very efficiently. And uh, we're interested in the optimal policy that is described by optimal Bowman equations uh, presented on the slide. And in the end of the day, what, uh, what we're interested to do, we are interested uh, to settings and we don't know uh, transition kernel, we know only reward function, for example, and we want to find, uh, the, find the optimal policy uh, as fast as we can. But at the same time, we don't want to suffer too much during this uh, learning process. So to th for, this, for this goal, uh, we can define regret minimization problem and just minimizing some of the optimality of each policy that was played during the episode, where each policy computed given all the previous data. Very classical setting. And right now we move to tabular MDPs. And uh, we will start from some uh, recall of uh, just uh, how to do exploration with coloring algorithm. So I will recall that coloring is, uh, uh, is an algorithm that, it, uh, that basically applies something like stochastic approximation uh, scheme uh, to solve uh, these equations, to solve these optimal by one equations. And we just uh, iterate this thing with some step sizes, uh, but additionally, to introduce exploration, we need to add some bonuses. This will drive our exploration. For example, if we want to have some uh, some guarantees, we can just take bonuses of the of the of this type, square root of h to the power three over number of visits, where l is some logarithmic factor, just uh, some logarithm something, and we will take alpha n, for example, of this. Of this, uh, of this schedule for this learning rate that depends on the number of visits on particular section pairs, it can be shown that uh, this colonial scheme achieves a very good bounds from point of view of regret uh, minimization. Just a quick question. Is this exploration bonus uh, supposed to depend on the action? It, uh, yes, it depends on the action because uh, here n is the number of visits for this particular state action pair. Right, right, so that right. means that it depends on the action. Okay. Okay, thank you for the question. Okay, I will continue. Yeah, uh, this thing is kind of, right now it can be considered as some classical thing. But okay, so it's uh, kind of well known. If we take such step size, take such bonuses, we have guarantees. What we can do alternatively? Alternatively, we can uh, do the following scheme. Uh, okay, well, let's re replace our learning rates by some, for example, beta distribution random variable. Beta is needed here to be bounded from zero to one because we're doing the stochastic approximation update. We want to have one minus uh, uh, learning rate and learning rate to be from zero to one, to be just positive. And we can do just this uh, sampling ran uh, random learning rates and learning of it. To introduce some optimism uh, to make proofs uh, feasible, I would say, we also in introduce some optimism by this maximization. So basically we have ensemble of uh, Q, of uh, capital J Q values. All this ensemble uh, consists of different covalues that different with uh, uh, that learned with uh, independent random learning rates, and afterwards, all these ensembles uh, are somehow aggregated by taking max of all of them, and uh, we will act according to this uh, Q bar n plus one without j, without this op optimistic estimate of it. So, and we can take, yes, yeah, so all this random learning grades. In some sense, uh, since we have this max, it should be somehow optimistic one. And by expectation, if we take, for example, uh, this uh, value of uh, this weights, it will, it will be an expectation equal to alpha n, maybe up to plus one. Maybe I just 
yeah, it should be beta h plus one n, not h. Uh, but anyway, we can just uh, very efficiently mimic what's going on here in expectation. But uh, typically, the main question what's going on with exploration properties of this algorithm and how it's supposed to work. Because, uh, because right now, we just put uh, random learning crates, put something that should drive it to be a little bit more optimistic or much optimistic, it depends on the choice of J. And uh, yeah, and it should work. There's a question. Mm -hmm. uh, hello, it's, it's me again. Yeah. So here, still, I mean, uh, because uh, in my understanding, because of the empty continuity bound of the beta distribution, it is a constant. Mm -hmm. And then you draw kind of this capital J is still log one divided by delta. And then this Q is optimistic, kind of a strong optimistic Q value, right? I mean. Uh, uh, sorry, just yeah, get a little bit lost. Uh, uh, yes. yeah, uh, the reason I mean, pick the maximum amount of uh, capital J mm -hmm. examples, right? Is then mm -hmm. we can have something like uh, this Q bar value is mm -hmm. greater than the kind of true value with high probability, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, it's yeah, good. exactly. So, will it work? I mean, the one if we only draw one beta, one beta sample, uh, Yes, yes, yes. So there's better samples and... You mean like capital J equals one? Does it work? Yeah, yeah. I think that's what she's asking. Oh, she's for asking capital J. single sample will work. Yeah, in, uh, in practice it works. In theory, um, it's not clear. So I would say like that. Yeah, okay, does. okay. This is what I want to know. Yes. So in empirically it works, but for the theoretical analysis it <clears throat> makes it work, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I, I would say that even uh, what I described here, in theory, it's, uh, at least for me personally, it's not clear how to analyze with this uh, schedule of learning crates. I will describe why it's hard to analyze even with this learning crates uh, 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 later. But basically, it's very hard to understand what's going on by the, uh, just one uh, update of cloning. Yeah, because here we have uh, a lot of uh, a lot of variants uh, for for only one uh, learning crate, and it's kind of not so clear uh, what's going on under the hood. Oh, I have a, a follow up question. So why you here? Mm -hmm. You 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 pick a beta distribution instead of, mm -hmm. for example, Gaussian distribution. So why? Yeah, and uh, that's a very good question, and I have answer on it uh, on the next slide. Okay. Yes, it's. Uh, it's the main question that I yeah, that so uh, was answered here. Uh, so if we roll out all these iterates of uh, this thing, if we just describe the definition of this Q bar uh, and roll out to the very end, to the Q bar one, we will end up with something that looks like that. And it turns out that if we take uh, this guys' this weights as a beta distribution this uh, capital uh, V weights will be so-called generalized DRK distribution. It's some uh, a little bit weird generalization of DRK distribution that's much more general, uh, that's uh, much harder to analyze. But anyway, it's some fixed distribution that we can t take something, uh, talk something about it. And if you take this beta weights of one particular form, it's not H in with this particular choice, it's not usually clear. Because here we have, for example, we have uh, a little bit of bias with respect to last samples. And for Dirichlet, we should not have things like that. There is a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, hello. Hi. hi. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit curious about, uh, yeah. actually, I'm a little bit confused about this kind of small j and i think it should be a sample right indicating the sam uh, indexing the sample along the whole population of the q function right uh, and so, you, uh in another way put it how many j uh, you need how many j uh so here kind of for for theory with additional tricks to make uh, this thing uh, just usually okay it's just logarithmical in uh, everything 
that's logarithmical in number of states, actions, capital T. It's not, uh, it's not very large. Uh, and how does this thing affect your final uh, guarantee? I think that he'll describe. Let's let's yeah, yeah, let's to the yeah. Next, yeah. Oh, you, I think that that is also the thing that it's a different algorithm than it would be just randomly choose one of the models and then follow that, which would be closer to ensemble sampling. This is not quite ensemble sampling. You have an ensemble, but you're taking the maximum of the predicted values by the elements of the ensemble, and then you follow the, the resulting estimate. So it's more like ensemble is used to create UCB values or something like that. Yeah. Sounds like that. Yeah, yes. thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I have a question. I was a little bit uh, late to join. So these, the weights that you have there, you, how do you initialize them? Uh, and then you optimize them when together when you optimize the, the Q uh, value, like oh. kind of the sub act of critic, you know, then you optimize the temperature is something similar. Uh, not, not really. So yeah, uh, kind of the distribution for this, uh, for this weights are changing uh, over time, but it changes with number of visits. So it's not, it's optimized in some sense, but it's kind of optimized in some predictive manner as an usual cloning. Okay, so, so the, basically that's good ways it will be optimized for the uh, the number of events during the hori time horizon, I guess. If you have extended, that will be a different value of the weight. It's what I understand uh, within the beta distribution of Arduinos. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I think the weights depend on the horizon. Yeah, is, is that what you're asking? Yes, the weights, yes. the distribution of the weights depends on the horizon yeah, and yeah. the n. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So I will. I will continue with uh, yeah, with a little bit understanding why the weights are beta. And why they chosen on this way? So the main reason they, why uh, here or this slide they chosen this way to make sure that expectation it's almost the same thing as just usual cloning, so basically. And for usual cloning, our learning rates are depend on h and on n. So it's one of the simple answer uh, how it uh, should look like. Right? Uh, can I? Uh, add one more clarification question. So these mm -hmm. weights, they are the same for all little index age, right? Like be between the stages, you're using the same. Ah, between way. stages, uh, it's uh, it should be different, uh, but I'm I'm not sure that it's yeah. It's simplifying uh, the notation. You drop that index. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, it should be different for all state action pairs for h it okay. should be resampled uh, for each state action pair after taking it got it okay yeah yeah maybe uh, maybe not but it's need to take a look on the proof so it's uh, any dependencies but i um, was always thinking about it it should be resampled from scratch for given state action pair yeah that that's what i would think yeah. okay Okay, is there any other questions regarding the algorithm itself? And if in the in the scratch, it's uh, uh, it's using the same things, but using non 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 monotonous uh, random learning rates with distributions that depends on exactly the same quantities as uh, learning rates for usual cloning also depends on the horizon and also number of uh, num number of visits for this detection pair to m make it close an expectation to what we have before and introduce some ucb type thing uh, by taking max of uh, this small j okay and uh, yeah, and i will move, uh, we move back to the slide so basically we uh, roll out all the iterates uh, for this randomized cloning, we end up with this weighted sum 
of initial core value and, uh, and uh, targets for next k. And we've weighted with generalized directly distribution. But I will I will define it a little bit later on the later on the next slide. But the main thing that we can compare to we can compare to just usual Pascal sampling algorithm. And in usual Pascal sampling algorithm, we can uh, we can decompose the Dirichlet weights uh, to to the Dirichlet weights for one particular sample. And we can have, for example, weights of uh, this type. So we have some prior, for example, some prior weights for some prior distribution with some Q-value Q bar one. It will be Q-value for the prior. And we have a weighted sum with the Dirichlet weights of the targets and the only difference, the two differences between uh, randomized cloning and posterior sampling, basically. The first difference is to using outdated values, but it's because uh, we need to pay to be model free. And second one, uh, in the randomized cloning, we use generalized directly distribution. It is more general, but it also can be used in posterior sampling, for example, because it's also conjugate uh, to categorical one. And in usual posterior sampling, we use just usual directly distribution. So in some sense, uh, this uh, randomized cloning approximates posterior sampling algorithm with some a little bit uh, more strange distribution over the weights. That's uh, yeah, very hard to analyze. Yeah, I will I describe it here to, yeah, to understand that it's uh, kind of rather hard distribution to take a look on. Uh, so this distribution basically with this, such a type of density, it's not uh, very friendly density as it was before for uh, directly distribution for directly distribution density is much more i would say user friendly here we have additional product of this uh, previous way uh, one minus all the previous uh, prefix of all access and this distribution is much harder to analyze in directly but it's more uh, the most beautiful property is that how it could be characterized through better random variables so basically, we can get distribution with this density if we have exactly the scheme as we have with, uh, in, inside our colonic. If we try to write uh, this weight, and basically, the generalized distribution was defined as uh, such generalization using this beta random variables. And even these parameters, alpha 1, alpha n, beta 1, beta n, corresponds to the parameters of, the, of this beta random variables. So basically, yeah, I think that this alternative characterization should be used as a, uh, kind of the main definition of the generalized directly distribution. So it's exactly distribution that appears after such a products of beta random variables. And it will be some distribution over simplex that's uh, more complicated than directly distribution. But uh, under some changes of alphas and betas, this distribution can be just equal to usual Dirichlet. And it's a trick that uh, allow us to analyze this thing because uh, using some developed trick, uh, develop uh, tricks, develop techniques, uh, for example, that I was presenting on the previous talk, with this analysis of Dirichlet weighted sums, analysis for generalized Dirichlet weighted sums is not, uh, is not feasible with the same technique, I would, I would say. So, and the main, the main goal is to reduce the analysis to usual directly distribution. And to do it, we need to do, to have a little algorithmic trick that unfortunately works very poorly in practice, but in theory, it allows to do, do all the job uh, kind of quite efficient. So if we have, so first observation, if we have weights, not H and N, but something. This kappa is just uh, some additional inflation coefficients. For a moment, you can take uh, in your mind kappa equal to one. If we have, for example, horizon equal to one in this formula, we end up with just uh, usual decay distribution. But considering MDP with horizon one, it's not, it's not that interesting. 
uh, in our case. So, so, but anyway, we have the property that if weights are distributed in this way, then this vector of uh, just this capital weights follows usual directly distribution. Exactly the same in as in posterior sampling. But the problem here is that if we take a learning rate of, of this type, we end up with problem with bias, as was uh, noticed in the original cloning proven efficient paper on exploration with cloning. So if we take uh, expectation of it as this orange line, we have too much weight on the very old samples and it will lead to very large bias. And it's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not rather possible to prove something uh, for this regime. It's not, uh, I, I believe it's not proven that it's impossible to prove something, uh, but uh, all the existing proof uses the idea uh, that, for example, this uh, learning rates are H plus one over H plus N, they somehow forget all the samples beyond one over H fraction of the most recent one. But at the same time, we can say, okay, this uh, learning rates, in theory, need to somehow to smooth, uh, they have smooth behavior be, uh, be, uh, between taking last one over H fraction of samples with some non negligible weight and forgetting all the past. But let's just do it very directly. Let's just forget all the past beyond uh, the most recent one over H fraction of samples and uh, forget everything else and have such as this uh, with this expectation of this weight we will have just something like that like like this green curve it's not uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it should, I, I should make it a little bit more bold but you can see the idea so the, we, we just want to very directly emphasize the, uh, the weights for the last samples and make uh, only this uh, last one of H fraction of samples. Mm -hmm. If some positive weight, everything else make just directly zero. And basically it could be done by some algorithmic trick. So we divide for one selection pair, we divide all the computation on the stages. With uh, increasing size of uh, to guarantee that for that we have such number of samples during this stage is about one of each fraction of all the samples. So, and uh, for all the scheme, we take, for example, prior uh, and in the beginning of each stage, then this n tilde equal to kind of equal to zero, we will update uh, we will initialize again our temporary co-values. So we have uh, this temporary co-values. Is it somehow as some maximum value or something like that? And afterwards, for each visit, each uh, subsequent visit of this detection pair, we do uh, uniform from point of view expectation updates uh, with th this learning rate. So we exactly the scheme that I described previously on this slide. But uh, we need to divide the computational stages to make sure that we have not generalized directly distribution, but something more tangible with usual directly distribution for which we can prove something. So it's very theoretical trick to do, uh, but with, with the scheme, so if we take these weights dependent on the current number of visits during the current epoch. And afterwards, in the end of each epoch, then epoch is finished, we update our global, uh, global co-value Q bar and global V value as V bar. And, we, and exactly this algorithm with logarithmic number of the J can attain regret, uh, regret bound. Unfortunately, for the very initial algorithm, we've just using beta H and N. Uh, I, I don't know how to, uh, how to provide any regret guarantees, even if you've taken max over some number of samples. Java has a question. Yeah, yeah and on the next slide, when you were explaining this modified algorithm, is, is an epoch the same as a stage here, or like what's going on? Like, 
Uh, yes, sorry, yes, I just, yeah, I was, uh, yeah, I have a little bit confused notation. Yeah, epoch and stage is uh, synonyms uh, on the slide. Okay, so you will have epochs, yeah. and at the beginning of an epoch, you kind of forget all the other data, or like, what, what's happening? You just keep the, the V, like the data from the previous epochs is summarized in the V value, so like, where is... Why are you keeping the previous data like? Oh, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a good question. The previous data is summarized in uh, cube uh, in QBAR. Uh -huh. So it summarizes all the previous previous data for the previous epoch. I see. What do you mean by previous, Chava? Like just the previous epoch or the? Or the previous epochs, right? No, like, I don't uh, think you are supposed to keep that, right? That's the whole point of the model free, right? <laughs> Is that yeah, but like a summary of that, like you want that data to influence uh, the outcome. And I was wondering how the, because I just see the, suddenly the rewards are initializing this Q tilde values. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, like, did we just throw away all the information that we had in previous epochs? Uh, so I, I'm trying to see that, that the data from the previous epochs is going to influence the the uh, the values in in the current That's a good point, yeah. and Sorry, I I'm, a bit, like a bar. I'm mm. a little bit confused if it's just you know you have an epoch but an epoch have time steps that is a t and i think this related with the horizon of t1 t2 three four three thing and then you repeat the algorithm a few epochs so uh I was just as well wondering more or less the same that I apologize, your name is Saba. I think that if you are saving as well this, these uh, results uh, every time step, and then during the time step, once you do the summatory, it goes to the results of the epoch, and then you iterate and go to all the epoch, but then you get the optimization that you need less time steps, and then you update your value function. I think the confusion is like, is the time step state, the time step is not same as epoch, right? Yeah, yeah. No. So epoch uh, is, uh, and we have update of epoch if uh, number of visits is just n is uh, just one plus one over h to some power. Okay, so they're only logarithmic number of epochs. Yeah. So you throw it's away all the data each. in the beginning of an epoch, okay. Yeah, it will scale, uh, it will logarithmic from point of view of t, but also you scale with h to guarantee that yeah. last uh, uh, we have not half of samples, but one of h fraction of samples. For example, for usual doubling trick, as in Shirel 2, we will guarantee that we have half of uh, widgets, for example. It just uh, updates and we doubled all this thing. Here we update not in the doubled, but we have one plus one over h fraction. So it's kind of Dublin trick with uh, fresh samples, not lazy doubling trick with using all, all the previous data, but only fresh uh, data. With no standard schedule, with not doubling, but with uh, this one plus one over H increase. So there are like, they, so V bar still, V bar doesn't get reset. But yeah, we, we, are, we are never reset it. Yeah. We are always updated as max of all the square values. And all the square values, if you take a look on, on it a uh, little bit more close, so we have this update. We have our epochs or stages defined for each selection pair. Right. So this V bar mixes information for different right. selection pairs. Right. So only Q tilde is the one that you are resetting in a yeah. way. Okay. Yeah, only even and only even temporary uh, Q that's uh, defined mm -hmm. here with this random weights. They completely reset it. Yes. Okay. Chaba, does that help? Yeah, I'm. I'm yeah. Uh, so so Vbar is scaring the previous information. Vbar right. is not yeah. getting reset. Yeah, but yeah. Q did that. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. So, right, there is a time index T. Yeah, it's global T. Uh, it's not connected to the uh, to the stage or epoch. 
uh -huh, uh -huh. yeah it just global t uh, right. our epoch depends on the number of visits of particular section pair so our epochs are local we have and this epochs is so something like dublin trick but we've right. not dublin but with something a little bit more strange yeah got it yeah i think i understand thanks okay perfect okay any other questions thank you for Else? Can I have a very quick question? Uh, yeah, sure. So is this like modified version of the algorithm you described in the beginning? Uh, mm -hmm. Then in practice, you also use this uh, in implementation or you use uh, the first one. And the expectation of the weight here is also alpha n or not? Uh, so the first question, uh, unfortunately, in practice, uh, it turns out this, this algorithm is quite a kind of is does not work very well. So and in our experiments, we were using the first version of it with, uh, with a, with, without this uh, Dublin trick. It turns out that this Dublin trick affects uh, computation uh, kind of very highly because basically the main reason I, I would call that uh, that we, yeah, we update, uh, we use outdated policy to collect new data. Here it's a little bit, uh, yeah, it's a little bit bad, especially if we try to do some deep exploration things. We need to kind of change our policy rather often, but uh, it's limited by this uh, Dublin trick thing. So the, for the first question. And the second question, can you repeat it, please? Sorry. The uh, expectation of the word here is this like also alpha n as the algorithm you described in the beginning or it's not? Yeah, here uh, the expression will be one one over n bar, but n bar itself is for the n over h. So in some sense, uh, the expectation range should be kind of the same. From perspective of uh, this plot, we're doing more like this green thing. Not in expectation it will be green thing, not the blue thing. Ah, okay, okay. It's uh, yeah, it's just, just this general weights uh, w. The, this capital W, how it's distributed if we take a lot of samples, and we use the green strategy. It is less efficient in practice, but in theory, gives the same guarantees. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question here. I'm not sure whether my understanding is mm -hmm. correct. So this Q tilde is a non-decreasing function? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the aptitude, sorry. This Q tilde is a value that is not decreasing with the episode. Uh, this uh, this Q uh, this Q, Q tilde. So uh, in we need to update this Q tilde value at the end of kind of each episode, right? Uh, yeah, for each visit, yeah, each uh, Q value t and with for any j updated with different uh, random yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then with a high probability this. Q day Q value is not increasing, right? It's kind of decreasing. Uh, with, so with edge, with edge, yeah. With edge, are you asking with edge? Uh, I mean, this Q, Q day value. I mean, uh, not, not uh, I, I'm not sure here which one is the, uh, not the horizon, but the episode index. Why will it be non? I think it's just the total reward starting from H to the end of the horizon. So it will be it will be decreasing in little h. Yeah, decreasing. Yeah, I mean, if, if R, it depends on R H, but yeah, generally. Yeah, and uh, also with high probability, this Q2, the value is like a, a optimistic uh, estimation of the uh, true Q value for the optimal policy, right? I mean, yeah, for Q tilde, it's not true because yeah. we have uh, fluctuations around the mean, but if you take max, it will be true. Okay, max. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, max is crucial to be optimistic here. Without max, okay, we have something like usual posterior sampling. And with max, we have optimistic posterior sampling. Okay, I see. Daniel, okay. can you give some intuition of what this R0 is? Like, is it some kind of the r0, r zero is should be equal to two it's technical it's a kind of technical artifact of 
uh, kind of, of anti-constriction bounds. I will show it a bit later. But what is it supposed to capture? It's uh, supposed to capture that uh, we we want to have a prior for our yeah for our for our Dirkel distribution. But the reward from the rest of the yeah, and the reward should be uh, larger by, for example, factor two than okay. all the possible rewards uh, we can get. Okay. It should be much larger. So that's. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's kind of technical artifact of the proof technique. Mm -hmm. okay. Right. I think I think we are kind of running out of time. So maybe you need to. Okay. Let's yeah. Let's uh, yeah. Let's go a little bit faster. Okay. So as uh, yeah, as for example, if someone uh, yeah, saw my previous uh, talk, so kind of for this uh, serial sampling type algorithms with optimism, I divide just proof on two parts. First part is just we need to show that this thing is optimistic enough and it's need, needed to be done by some anti concentration bound. And the second thing is we need to show that, okay, but in the worst case, basically all, this, all these things are not worse uh, than just uh, the bonus based counterparts. So, for example, we can, yeah, we can have something like that. So, we, will, we have. We want to prove first thing that our Q bar is really optimistic, as we discussed a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And also we want to show that uh, an expectation, uh, basically, we, we will pay for the overestimation with using this randomization, we will pay no more than some usual bonuses. That's the idea. And we'll start from the first part. And for the first part, uh, I have this very s scary inequality that I was uh, talking about uh, the previous time. But uh, here I wrote it a little bit in a more general, uh, more general framework to, uh, to underline why we can use it in more general scenarios that was described previously, for example, and uh, more general scenarios in tabular setting. That's, so for what does this theorem t uh, tell us? So we have some weights alpha. In our case, everything except alpha zero will be just one over kappa, some, some factor. And we have uh, just expectation of this thing without taking into account this plus one. This plus one is a technical thing because it will disappear. Uh, then we move to, move to anti concentration thing. We have alpha bar is the sum of this alpha that is really matters without this plus one. And then if we take alpha zero large enough, scaling logarithmically with alpha bar and plus some constant, depends on the additional quality of this Gaussian approximation. And alpha bar is also large enough. So that means that we don't have very degenerate distribution. So distribution is degenerate we should not expect Gaussian behavior. If it's spread it enough, we may expect Gaussian behavior. Okay, and we have F uh, that assigns for all this, uh, that's all this uh, weights for our Dirichlet distribution for the, all the atoms, some value. And here we assume that for zero value, we have such value B0. And for all other values, it will be at least two times smaller than this, uh, than this B0 smaller than B, is it smaller than B0 over two. So that means that our zero atom have much larger weight than all, all other atoms. And it will be our prior in the end of the day. We have priors that should be very optimistic to be sure that it uh, control everything in the case of small alpha bar. We have such a bound in, for small alpha bar. We need to have such a very large prior that if this alpha zero should be large enough, this B zero should be large enough, and it's needed to control in the small sample regime. And what we want to show, we have uh, directly weighted sum with some function f. In our case, it will be our v, uh, v value. Larger than some mu, it will be expectation of our V value with respect to real model, in our case. It will be larger than equal than such a quantity. And what's the most important in this quantity is that uh, basically have alpha bar, this k inf thing. k inf is exactly the same k inf that appears in lower bounds for bandits. 
And uh, yeah, here we have new bar. It's a empirical measure, uh, kind of expected empirical measure of what we have with this function f. And k inf, it is uh, yeah, k inf with respect to yeah, or this. It's better to write down it as it's uh, written down in the bottom of the slide is projected Kullback uh, distance. So we try to project our measure uh, new bar to some measure xi that have expectation at least at least mu. And it have also dual formula that was uh, appear in the in the proof for this theorem, just exactly in the dual form. And basically, the most important fact that we we have to notice here that this thing does not depend on on the number of uh, number m, the number of atoms, and if nothing depends on the number of atoms in this formulation, uh, very direct directly at least. So we have some k inf between two measure uh, between measure and some value mu. It can be arbitrary measure. It can be even not uh, finally supported because this definition is not related to any final supported things. And we can uh, apply it in modular setting. I will return to it a little bit later if, if I will have time. So, and, but in our case, for example, we can apply this, uh, this thing, uh, this way of thinking about this inequality as uh, something about Dirichlet processes or something around this thing as follows. We have, uh, in the posterior sample, we have model multiplied by v star so expectation with respect to the sampled model here i can say okay i have weighted sum with uh, this weights no oh, yeah with this weights uh, with the clear weights uh, and basically what we want to show this marks help us a lot and therefore we need to show the optimism in only local and weak form uh, we need to show that uh, we have optimism for one step with a positive probability. Just some gamma, that some constant, 0 0.01, or something like that. And we want to show that this probability is positive. And if you take uh, J of logarithmic order, we will end up with uh, that we can prove, uh, prove it for any state action pairs, any age at the same time, so this simultaneously. And to show this thing, we can just uh, apply uh, what we have uh, from this theorem. From this, uh, from this theorem, we've taken epsilon equals, for example, one half. We have such a bound, one half, one minus this Gaussian thing, where we have uh, zeta is this key in between our empirical measures between the star. And expectation of uh, and expectation of v, v star sam with states sampled from the state. And here we see that okay, here we have this our S K I H plus one is uh, samples from categorical distribution P H uh, with P H S A. So it's a categorical distribution sampled from our states, and this measure is some sense random, and we can write down some concentration bound on it in this style. So our key inf have order 1 over n, and also it uh, does not depend on dimension, because this key inf is projected measure, it does not depend on any dimension that appears here, appears in this formula. And this allows us to use uh, this kappa, only logarithmic one, to, to overcome this effect of this logarithms uh, that goes in the, on this key inf. So we can match those, these two things and just have one minus phi of one. Something like that. So very, very good number. It's not, it's not very, very small. Something reasonable. And afterwards, uh, yeah. And afterwards with all this thing, we can just apply some uh, usual uh, in the induction argument with replacing V bar by V star in lower bound by induction over H. And apply this bounds for concentration. Okay, I have very limited time. That I, I will move to the, another challenge that appears that was not appeared previously. 
uh, in the my previous talk about uh, pasteur sampling with model based pasteur sampling, but in model free pasteur sampling, we have an additional new challenge that appears here, appears in this uh, in this sum. It's not uh, really kind of very difficult challenge to be honest, but it's very interesting because uh, for control the thing, I applied inequalities that's kind of non really common in uh, bandits and red community. I would say. So we want to control something like that. The problem here is that our V bar it depends on the previous weights. They uh, yeah they our weights our small weights. Uh, we are dependent, sorry, so misprint. Uh, the weights itself are dependent between each other, and also our V bar, it depends on the previous weights. So, a lot of dependencies, uh, and we cannot just very uh, apply very simple argument of concentration for the fixed uh, V bar or the fixed weight vector. But we can notice that, for example, such a guys are marking a different sequence. So if we form uh, the Sphinx with uh, weights and uh, V-bar, we will martingale different sequence. And fortunately, uh, unfortunately, it cannot be controlled uh, by just very stupid application of Azuma Hebdin of Bernstein inequality, because our beta weights, so this weights itself, have also the beta distribution. But it can be equal for or zero or one, it can be anything in between. And our zeta are bounded only by h. And therefore, we need to, yeah, to do something more smart. And one of the smart things that uh, yeah, I noticed, uh, I think that it would be rather interesting to, to show, it is Rosenthal type inequality. Uh, so it's uh, inequality that, uh, that's, that controls not uh, just directly high probability uh, things. But it controls uh, p moments of the distribution. Basically, it states yeah, as, uh, as follows: It looks very, very similar to just uh, Bernstein inequality, but instead of just taking uh, kind of maximum maximum value, just upper bound, we have expectation of max to the power p. We have p moment of the max for all the sequence. And it turns out that if, for example, if our random variable is sub-exponential, as it happens in the case of beta distribution, then this max can much better. And it's just a uh, quantity of 1 over n, of order 1 over n here. So here I just uh, applied uh, a very stupid bound for variance to have the first uh, term of the right order to have bonus, uh, right bonuses. And the second, uh, and the second term, is uh, just b over n, this all second of the term, with some strange constants due to high generality of this uh, inequality, because this inequality holds uh, for any, uh, yeah, kind of in very, very gen general setting. Uh, but if we apply it here, we have such b over n for the second of the term. If we apply just a uh, very simple Bernstein argument, it will have just b. It will not de decay over n because our axes uh, are bounded by not very good value. So that's, that's because our weights they sub 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 Gaussian with very bad constant, but sub exponential with very good constants. And therefore, we need to understand this behavior much better. And also, kind of, it's possible to do all the stuff. With less elegant methods, uh, we've just uh, first uh, apply some concentration for weights, afterwards doing something with this uh, new sequence. But uh, I found this way very elegant to, to do exactly the required job without any additional clipping, without any additional artificial tricks. That's very beautiful inequality. Okay, and uh, for the tabular case, uh, everything's Answers here how it works uh, in uh, kind of in tower on tower experiments on some ten on ten grid vote. So here it's uh, yeah, it works worse than model based algorithms, but it, you uh, but you may expect it. But it works uh, uh, kind of much much better than colonic with optimistic bonuses. 
for, for such a type of environment. So that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of the main practical takeaway. That's, okay, we will take this very strange thing uh, with using random step sizes. It turns out that in practice, it somehow works. Uh, and in theory, it's also possible to prove something, but with additional uh, algorithmic tricks that uh, not working really in practice, but uh, in theory, uh, they allow us to, to derive right worst case guarantees. Also, I have some story about metric MGPs, but unfortunately, I don't have the time for it, I think. What organizers can say about it. Mm -hmm. I think we should wrap up now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Unfortunately, I have to skip this thing, but I will just say two words about it. Uh, and just uh, yeah, two, uh, two words. Uh, that basically, what we had to do to do this metric space, we need to introduce additional new assumption. Uh, that is, I found quite interesting. This, uh, yes, the first assumption, it holds basically almost, uh, almost uh, kind of for any good enough Markov, Markov chain. So that means that our, our kind of our sample of the next state is a sum function of state action pair and independent random variable. So it's something uh, closer to what, uh, yeah, what's going on in just uh, usual control literature. So it's described uh, as this way. But the most important thing is that this. Uh, Random variables are really independent for any age, for any state action pair, everything is independent here. And all the randomness hidden in this and the variables. So you can think about it as a setting random seed for, for your simulator. And also the, the assumption that is stronger than was uh, introduced before is that this F is Lipschitz function itself for any fixed uh, random seat. You, you may expect this thing by, uh, from any simulator, for example. So any simulator for any random seat should behave well. Not for general random seat, but for any random seat. It's the thing that you may expect from good simulators. And basically, yeah, and basically from this condition follows, for example, Lipschitzness in Wasserstein one distance from which one distance uh, uh, also holds Lipschitz in Q star. And for tabular setting, everything works exactly as I described here, uh, because, uh, yeah, because we don't have a uh, good definition of Lipschitzness for tabular setting. Everything, is bound, everything that is bounded is Lipschitz. So, and algorithm is almost the same if we take some discretization of the space, except that we need stronger prior. And this strong prior is needed uh, because we need to additionally have optimistic estimate for discretization, discretization error. And to control uh, this discretization error, we need uh, this reparameterization assumption and additionally this additional prior. So that's... Okay, and uh, in metric space, it works... Uh, it works better than uh, kind of just usual adaptive version with bonuses. That's a good news. Uh, the news with comparison that uh, kernelized DCBVI works much better uh, than uh, all the uh, all other algorithms for such type of so, such setting. But it's thing that is uh, less uh, expected for this uh, for this setting, but. But anyway, uh, this randomization uh, be, uh, beats just usual bonus based uh, things in practice because it's more kind of more kind of adaptive Terrific. and i will yeah i will finalize uh, all the story so what i was talking about i was talking about the randomized expression for cloning that's uh, given by using random step sizes draft exploration and additional taken ensemble to make it optimistic and interpretation for it, it is uh, somehow mod model-free approximation of posterior sampling. And this model-free approximation of posterior sampling enjoys uh, very good guarantees, or uh, similar as uh, as cloning with curving bonuses uh, for tabular setting and for, and for matrix setting, also. And in experiments, it works uh, better than this very very usual cloning with uh, UCB bonuses. 
So, and I think that's a, a little bit late, but. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> so, Bingshan has a question. I also have a question for Daniel. Yeah. yeah, I promise it will be my last, uh, my last question. So, for the theoretical analysis, you need to, I believe, at a certain point, you need to define a history, right? To collect the outer history information, right? All the history information. What the do you mean? The calligraphic F, like uh, the, for example, the observed rewards and also the, basically the empirical stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely okay. needed to yeah, to have martingale type arguments. Yeah. yeah, but for that part, so do you also need to collect the beta random variables? Yeah, yeah. So also in this, uh, yeah, in this filtration, it's hidden the values of the previous beta random variables. Yeah, exactly. So you also put the random variables, for example, beta random variables in the filtration part, right? As the history information, right? Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. So my question is like a little bit more general. Like I, mm -hmm. what was, did you consider randomizing the Q values directly instead of randomizing the alphas? Uh, like, what's the intuition behind, like, for example, if you use Gaussian to just randomize the Q values? Uh, yeah, to, uh, I, I did not consider this thing, but uh, kind of as I feel, it should work uh, kind of uh, kind of the same mm -hmm. uh, as here. And kind of maybe the difference here is that to make, for example, all this thing uh, variance adaptive, we just need to a little bit refine uh, this concentration bound, basically. So this concentration bound should be a little bit refined to have dependence on, var on variance. That's almost, uh, yes, it can be done very easily. Just taking a look on everything here more precisely, I would say. Uh, but uh, the bonus of using uh, uh, such type of randomization that connect to posterior sampling that, for example, for optimistic posterior sampling, we have automatic adaptation to variance and all higher moments. Whereas if we use Gaussian noise, we need to somehow introduce this information inside of this noise. As what's happened for randomized least square square iteration, if we want to make it work uh, with near optimal guarantees, we need to uh, have uh, the variance of this Gaussian noise dependent on the estimate of the of the variance of our of of our p hat and value, mm -hmm. but yeah, I, I think that it's uh, it's absolutely possible to yeah, to just have usual weights and additionally introduce a randomly squares square iteration style just Gaussian noise. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah, quite possible. Any other questions? I, I have a, a general question like. Uh, on the, the, your work about the um, optimism under uncertainty without bonus here is by you have like kind of an upper confident bound uh, based on the DZIC lab that's something from the DZIC lab distribution of the transition for example and uh, in this case it's a beta and then you have a theory um, for example if I can formulate Q as like categorical distribution and maintain the DZIC lab as a prior and then also the posterior is this left then can i also have something similar in all of your three paper uh yeah, yeah. i think that's yeah so if you have something like uh yeah something like uh, a more general declare process if you have some categorical things or something like that you declare prior so the main ingredient, the most uh, difficult part of all the proofs was uh, yeah, was uh, was around this anti concentration bound because it allows to provide uh, provide this local weak optimism uh, kind of very very precisely i would say and it's yes it's a crucial thing and you can yeah you can uh, re reuse uh, this result for yeah, for any declare later situations i would call it like that okay Thank you. Chaba has a question. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
do you think that uh, this learning rate randomization generalizes in a seamless fashion to linear bandits and and beyond some non-linear bandits, generalized linear bandits, and so on and so forth? Uh, so it's it's a good question. I was thinking about it. I was thinking about yeah, how it generalizes. So I think that's to yeah, to linear settings. It's uh, kind of the Dirichlet distribution is a little bit less natural appears here uh, appears here, but uh, for example, it's uh, it's it's hard to think about it because typically for linear bandits, for linear MDPs, for all this thing, uh, they used uh, maximum likelihood estimates that's very friendly to some Gaussian things. So we have uh, interpretation as uh, kind of Gaussian linear regression with Gaussian noise, and it's very natural to introduce Gaussian noise and not uh, such a Dirichlet or beta noise. So I think that uh, for linear setting, it's less natural to consider such type of algorithm. I would like to answer like that. But it's possible, I, I believe. No, so so this yeah the reason I'm asking is because I'm trying to gain some more intuition about this learning rate randomization, mm -hmm. uh, yes, and 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 by asking this question, I'm trying to you know like sharpen my understanding yeah. like yeah. where it's coming from. You can imagine uh, like incremental updates of linear models and uh, and oh, doing oh, calculations uh, in linear models. Uh, so, but but it's it's a little bit unclear to me, like whether okay, like even for the linear setting, whether it works or beyond the linear setting, where it's going to work. I guess one of the main motivations you had is is that if you are in a deep learning scenario, then maybe you're using an incremental update to update some models. And then what do you have there? Like you can randomize the data and you can randomize maybe the step size. Mm -hmm. And you were kind of just wondering whether the step size randomization can be a way to induce sufficient exploration. Uh, so that, that's, that's why I'm also wondering about whether this is altogether is going to lead to some interesting uh, generalizations uh, in these more complex cases. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So one of the kind of interpretation in more general setting of all this scheme, if we take a look, for example, on what we have in the very end screen procedure, we will have something like that. If not, we start, but we bar. It's really important. But the main thing that here, if we, for example, have fixed detection pair, it's not realistic in the deeper setting, but if you have fixed detection pair and sample some states from there, it's basically, will be related to Dirichlet processes and we have a uh, posterior uh, distribution. If we have our prior of our space of uh, all transition kernels and this weights in somehow uh, this weights with such a direct measures like here, uh, they reproduces this, uh, this expectation in some sense of this thing we can think about this product V and F as uh, expectation with respect to measure sample from the Dirichlet process. Okay. And Dirichlet process, it's, yeah, it's some posterior distribution over space of probability measures. So in some sense, it allows us to think about it in more general situations. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, for me, it's not clear how to combine it, uh, how to combine it good with functional approximation thing. Uh, there exists yeah, such interpretation for more general scenarios, but yeah. Okay, interesting, good. Right. Any other questions? Right, thank you, Daniel. It was very interesting. Yeah.